honor for me to be here this evening and pay special tribute to Roger Baldwin, the First Amendment's most dedicated advocate. We join tonight as both celebrants and guardians of the freedom of speech. Back in uh, Boston, uh, a week ago, uh, one of my constituents came up to me and said, I hear that you're going to make a speech to the ACLU, and I hear those people go around <laughs> defending communists. And I said, oh, no, you've got it wrong. They defend communists and socialists, fascists, atheists, racists, segregationists, members of the Ku Klux Klan. The fellow said, uh, well, it, it sounds like a uh, mighty nice organization. <laughs> wrote that living in a democracy is like living on a raft. It never sinks, but your feet are always wet. <laughs> well, our feet are always wet. We've always got a struggle on our hands, and we will continue that way as far as we can see and as far as the need demands. Roger Baldwin began working for human rights in the early part of this century. He got into civil liberties work during the First World War, helping conscientious objectors fight what he thought was an unjust war. And in 1919 and early 1920, he and his colleagues founded the American Civil Liberties Union. He's always been a maverick. But he has some kind of very deep emotional identification with people who have had to battle their way up, even though he didn't have to. He had it. Harvard, class of 1905, a father who was a businessman in the Boston area. He was on his way to becoming a successful businessman or something like that. That's where he was going. I think it must have taken something pretty remarkable to say, I'm not doing that. Somehow he thought up this idea that no matter how despicable an individual's opinions may be, everybody has his free speech. And that was such a good idea that he set it up and it just kept going. He looks back upon a time when civil rights and civil liberties didn't exist anywhere near to the extent that they do today when free speech was just something that was not possible when you could get arrested for distributing a leaflet, when people didn't have the right to strike if they were oppressed on the job. When he started, it was 20 or 30 people who had nothing more but the bizarre belief that uh, they were going to somehow limit the government uh, in, in, its, in its powers. Um, uh, these were 20 or 30 people who got together to decide that they were going to enforce the Bill of Rights. Today, we handle 6,000 cases annually. We enforce the Bill of Rights on the government. We are the realization of the dream that Roger had. I've often thought it must be wonderful for him to look back upon those beginnings. Congress investigates communist activity in the United States. Representative Hamilton Fish of New York, heads committee. The Communist Party in the United States is merely a section of the Third International. The first time I met him was when he came to testify before my committee investigating communist propaganda. 90% of their work was defending communists for urging the overthrow of the government by force and violence. And I don't know anything more radical than being a leader in the fight against communism. Naturally, I was opposed to that organization, uh, Civil Liberties Union, and to Mr. Baldwin, who was head of it. I'm a radical in the sense that the Bill of Rights is radical. It is radical. I'm certainly radical in the sense that pacifism is radical, which is quite radical. Uh, always a man of peace and who is opposed to violence and coercion is regarded as radical because he doesn't go along with uh, some of the coercive measures of government. We were under suspicion that we were not really defendants of everybody's rights that we were very partial to the left, very partial to the union. It wasn't true. It was only that they happened to be our clients because they were the people who came to us for help. Nobody else would help them. 
The prosecution was so severe that somebody had to hire lawyers to defend them. It was the first time that a general organization held out its services to everybody whose rights were denied. It was a question of freedom of speech here for aliens who, who sought to overthrow the government by force and violence. And I was bitterly opposed to that. And uh, Mr. Baldwin, his organization, was in favor of it at that time. But the general concept that people have rights against the government, which the First Amendment asserts, is a very old one. And uh, the general doctrine of natural rights, that people have these rights as human beings, and the governments merely affirm them in some kind of a document or constitution, but the people who got them by their very nature, their right to speak and to print and associate, that those rights come with you, with your birth. Let me ask you about your private life. You told me that your private life had more effect on you than anything else. Your first marriage was to a very prominent international traveling feminist yes, yes. of her day. What was the attraction of a feminist in the 1930s? She was very good looking. You're not supposed to say that as the major attraction of a feminist. <laughs> well, I know, but also she was a woman of spirit, and so many interests that were exactly the interests that I had. I think that was the what really brought us together. Madeline was very committed to uh, ideas other than feminism. Yes, she was She was a lawyer, mm -hmm. socialist, feminist, pacifist, all the good things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever clash politically or ideologically? Oh, no, no, no. We just clashed domestically. Just domestically. <laughs> <laughs> was your second marriage joyful? Oh, yes, we had a absolutely unbroken experience for 30 years of very happy domestic life. Hardly an argument. We each stated our views and let it go. We didn't try to convert the other one. Ah, so you had introduced tolerance into your domestic life as that's well right, as your well, public that's right. life. Lots of troubles in marriage come from one trying to convert the other, dominate the other, in other words. Did she take your name? No. Not until after our daughter was born. Does that mean something to you? I was pleased, I guess. I'm not macho enough <laughs> to, to take pride in the uh, possession of a woman who taking my name. If I understood you correctly, <laughs> Roger, you said that God was not looking after you. I said that. How did you mean that? I have no sense of, uh, of, of anything super, supernatural. I confine my religious beliefs to humanity and the relations of man to man. And I think the leadership of Jesus in that respect has probably expressed a greater ethical sense than any other leader I know. The Sermon on the Mount is a great declaration of love. To love your enemies, to do good to people who do ill to you, to turn the other cheek. This is a great doctrine on the basis of all pacifism, on the basis of all future order. If people can do that, they can live together. Every day you have to live with hope for the next day. I think this process of looking ahead, hopefully to tomorrow, is the essence of being happy. That kind of hope has to feed longevity. <laughs> do you believe that? Yes, I do. I think it has a good deal to do with it. I notice as I hold your arm, I am doing it purely out of affection because you have no need of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding on for affection, too. <laughs> That's okay with me. <laughs> I'll probably get a nice girl under my arm. <laughs> It's very important that people take the initiative in defending themselves. Nobody will hear them if they don't do it. And silence doesn't get anybody anywhere. They have to speak up. The struggle that you pioneered in human rights has become an attempt at national policy. In many ways, I'm one of your children. 
my own uh, election to Congress probably would not have been possible without a lawsuit that Chuck Morgan uh, in the Southern office of the American Civil Liberties Union brought to uh, see to it that uh, the congressional districts were properly reapportioned. An idea for which you've given your life has made it possible for many, many other people to enjoy things that we would not have otherwise enjoyed. And so thank you very, very much. So anybody who's reaching 95 years of age has got to acknowledge it. Not only acknowledge it, but to take some pride in it. I take some pride in it because I have beat the insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> they give you no chance after 95. But I, I'm willing to keep going without insurance. I think you have to have a sense, a basic sense of wonder about the life. You know, you have to be aware of the fact that there is light and sun and stars and moon and air and nature. You have to be aware of the wonder of living. I was raised as a Unitarian in an atmosphere of intellectual curiosity. And I grew up with lots of household names, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, whose relatives we all knew, and Thoreau. His literary executive was my good friend in nature walks throughout the town. That whole New England atmosphere of challenging institutions got into me very early. You were one of the first anti-war protesters of this century. I was one of the first that went to jail, yes. <laughs> you actually welcomed the prison experience, as I understand. Well, I didn't welcome it. I enjoyed it, which is something different. It didn't trouble me spiritually at all, because I was doing what I thought was right. You would consider yourself a patriot, yes? Oh, of course. I How mean, I love, my, I love my people and I love my home. And uh, what more do you want out of patriotism? The hardly a week goes by that REA and I do not receive a typewritten memorandum, always with numbered paragraphs, saying to us what it is we're doing wrong and what is it once in a while that we're doing right. And if we don't respond promptly, I think the statute of limitations is 72 hours, <laughs> immediately there's a phone call. Did you get my memorandum? Well, what about it? Uh, well, I haven't had a chance to talk to Aria. He's in Illinois or in New Mexico. Well, hurry up, get back to me, speak to him. Goodbye, bang. And uh, I go back to my work, uh, quickly digging out his memorandum and thinking about how I'm going to explain our latest organizational uh, mistake or shortcoming to the person who is still not only our founder, but our conscience. The American Civil Liberties Union was formed in 1920. Even in those early days, we won quite a lot of cases. And we got a very dramatic case very soon after the uh, war ended, and that was the Tennessee Evolution case. Yes. Well, good morning, young ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, visitors. science lesson for today, we will continue our discussion of Darwin's theory of the descent of man. Now, as I told you yesterday, Darwin's theory tells us that man evolved from a lower order of animals, from the first wiggly protozoa here in the sea, to the ape, and finally, to man. Now, some of you fellows out there are probably going to say that's why some of us act like monkeys. <laughs> But what Mr. Charles Darwin was trying to tell us in his own way... Bertram T. Cates. Come off it, Sam. You've known me all my life. Bert, you're charged with violation of Public Act 31428, Volume 37, Statute Number 31428 of the State Code, 
which makes it unlawful for any teacher of the public school to teach any theory that denies the creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Bertram Cates, I hereby place you under arrest. <laughs> on the front pages of the newspapers all over the world because of the contrast between a democratic country establishing a Bible story as the only legitimate thing to teach children and to have the people who believed in evolution and in science trying to teach them a contrary theory. The right to think is not on trial here. Well, with all due respect to the court, sir, I think the right to think is very much on trial here. And it is fearfully in danger in the proceedings of this courtroom. A man is on trial, a thinking man. And he's faced with fine and imprisonment because he chooses to speak what he thinks. We sent a re release to the newspapers in Tennessee saying, anybody who wants to violate that law will get our help. And we got a fellow who volunteered, Mr. Scope. We uh, then organized a defense around it, but I don't think we ever dreamed at the time that it would attract the international attention it did. I think, from the point of view of publicity, it was the most famous case we ever had. Then we had two great protagonists in the case, Mr. William Jennings Bryan, who had been candidate for president of the United States and a very well-known fundamentalist orator, who volunteered to the prosecution to put this teacher in jail. And then we had Mr. Clarence Darrow of Chicago, a real tribune of the people, an extraordinarily able lawyer and a philosopher of science, opposed to this biblical interpretation. And they battled it all out in the Tennessee court. Can't you understand that if you take a law like evolution and you make it a crime to teach it in the public schools, tomorrow you can make it a crime to teach it in the private schools? And tomorrow you may make it a crime to read about it? And soon you may ban books and newspapers. And then you may turn Catholic against Protestant, and Protestant against Protestant, and try to foist your own religion upon the mind of man. If you can do one, you can do the other. Because fanaticism and ignorance is forever busy and needs feeding. We had to uh, put people on the firing line and let them get arrested and go to court uh, just in order to prove and the Bill of Rights meant what it says, that there should be no interference with freedom of speech. One of the continuing themes in the ACLU's work in these early years was the problem of vindication of labor's right to organize. It was a major issue, and very few people today can appreciate the bitterness and the extent of this struggle between the employers and the employees all over the United States. How many people died in that struggle and how many people were jailed in that struggle? The immense picket lines and the amount of strike breaking. We were effective because of our principles, not because of our size. Because we weren't very influential from the point of view of numbers of pressure, but we were quite influential when we went to court with a lawyer and uh, insisted that the Bill of Rights should be enforced and the courts paid attention. The trade union movement had a bat until the Supreme Court upheld the National Labor Relations Act. It ended practically all violent labor strife and was the first time that uh, the public authorities had enforced the Bill of Rights in, re in the industrial field. Tell us about the Patterson strike. That was not a strike in which we had so much violence, but we had police oppression. Uh, at a point in the strike, the police just closed all strike halls and said, no more meetings. And I went over to Patterson from New York because the strike leaders asked me to come and said, what are you going to do about opening up these halls? And I said, well, we'll have a public meeting on the city hall steps and we'll get a nice lot of American flags and we'll have a parade down at the city hall and we'll show that this is the Bill of Rights that we're defending. Well, we went, a whole, whole thousands of us. And as soon as we got to the city hall and started making speeches in favor of the Bill of Rights, the police cracked our heads and broke us up. And they arrested me. 
And I had a case in the Jersey court that I finally got acquitted by a unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court of Jersey <laughs> that I was doing the right thing defending the Bill of Rights on the city hall steps. The ultimate test of devotion to freedom is expressed by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who said, the test is whether you will accord freedom of expression to the idea you hate. A possible reason is there for giving civil liberties to people who will use those civil liberties in order to destroy the civil liberties of all the rest. That's a classic argument, you know. That's what they said about the Nazis and the communists, that if they got into power, they'd suppress all the rest of us. Isn't that, Therefore, isn't that true? Them. So, so we suppress them first. Mm -hmm. and that's all. We, we, we're going to use their method before they can use it. Well, that's it's contrary to our experience that in a democratic society, if you let them all talk, even those who would uh, deny civil liberties and would overthrow the government, that's the best way to prevent them from doing it. How did you work with the Klan? Way back when we first started, the Klan had really begun to show its power. Minutes, we had some complaints about the denial of the Klan's right to parade in their nightgowns and pillowcases and uh, their right to burn fiery crosses on private property. And we were faced with a rather troublesome question. And we decided that we had to defend their rights, and we offered it. And the Imperial Wizard, as I recollect, responded to my letters by thanking us for our generous expressions of true Americanism <laughs> and, uh, and telling us they would be glad to accept our services when necessary. <laughs> for the ACLU must be unequivocally supporters of civil liberties for all peoples. That means you can't make any exceptions to say, well, it's all right to have civil liberties here, but not there. Because the classic doctrine of civil liberties is has meant, as Oliver Wendell Holmes says, freedom for the ideas we loathe. Yes. And the case came up in Skokie, Illinois, where that principle had to be applied. The courts unanimously sustained our position in the Skokie case. Uh, not a single court dissented from our view that they should have a right to parade however offensive it was. So the fight is not just for us. Think of all those millions of white people all across Chicago who are looking for us today to see if we can make it. We can make it if we have self-control. And I'm sure we can. We can do it. We never defended anybody charged with an act of violence. We draw the line right there. And we said free speech is all right up to that point, but not to use violence to enforce it. I go back, when I think of it, to the pronouncement of Benjamin Franklin, who said, of course, the abuses of free speech should be suppressed. But to whom dare we entrust the power to do so? We have one decision after another, which have solidified the principles of the Bill of Rights. These are the natural rights of our personalities. And it is through the exercise of these rights that we become a civilized society. No superior right. We've got from the Supreme Court the doctrine of equality. We've got the doctrine of labor, rights to organize. We're facing difficult times. And we are going to resist now. Liberty never stays warm. You have to keep winning it over and over again. You have to amass your forces and resist. Just as Leonard Hand once said, that when liberty dies in the hearts of men and women, no constitution, no court, and no law can restore it. And we know that, that it is the spirit in America, the spirit which has grown in these last 50 years, 
which makes it possible for us to say that our democracy has gained in its spiritual and moral strength as well as in law. And I think that is a real contribution to the civil liberties you make. It's contribution to the spirit of liberty, to the spirit of resistance, to the spirit of determination, this courage, which as Justice Brandeis says, is the secret of liberty. Robert Louis Stevenson went through that to travel, hopefully, is better than to arrive. And the true reward is to labor. For I've been traveling, hopefully, with you for all these years. And I'm still traveling, hopefully. And so is the ACLU. And someday, sometime, but the goal is clear, and the road is hard, and progress painful. We are approaching, we are beginning to approach, a tolerable world of peace, order, and justice. <laughs>